Hello, everybody. Welcome to the College to Calling Summit. My name is Miko Lau, and the purpose of this online show is to inspire, educate, and empower fellow college graduates out there on how you can build a happy, successful, and abundant life centered exactly around what you love doing every single day. And today, we have a super amazing guest here with us. His name is Ace Bowers, and Ace launched his career in the high-tech industry uh, at Tibble as a QA engineer, and since then, he has mastered his quality assurance skills by working at big companies such as Yahoo and Google's corporate headquarters, and he recently published his first book, The Mindset, where he documented his super inspirational journey of going from janitor to Silicon Valley millionaire in just five years. And I'm super excited for him to be on here today to share about the challenges that he have overcame to build an amazing success that he has today in health, wealth, and happiness. So Ace, how are you doing today? I'm good, Miko. How are you? Good, good. I'm super excited to have you here. And thank you for all your time. I know that you have so much amazing insights and value to share with my audience. So let's mm -hmm. jump straight into it. Sure, yeah. Awesome. So all of us are super excited for you with all the amazing success that you have now. But why don't you take us back in time for a little bit to tell us more about where were you in your journey just five years ago, uh, financially, emotionally, mentally, physically? Where were you back then? Who was Ace? <laughs> um, okay, so when I started the journey, um, I was literally at rock bottom. So the ace that you see now today is not the ace that I was in the beginning of the journey. Um, and when I say that I was at rock bottom, I mean in all aspects. I was, um, you know, I was overweight. I was a pack a day smoker. I was depressed. I was in debt. Um, and I was literally cleaning toilets at a motel uh, for six bucks an hour. Um, so when I say rock bottom, I was really a rock bottom. And, um, and I, the, the thing about the way it was in the beginning of my journey is that's the life that I had sort of grown into. And there was nothing, um, uh, motivating me to change any of those things. Right. I knew that I had to change so much about my life, but there was no, there was nothing to light that fire, nothing to really motivate me to change. And that's, um, that's where I was at on, on the first day uh, of my journey. Wow, and that was only five years ago, about five years. Yeah, yeah, about. Wow, that's really, to see how much something can change in just a short span of time, like five years, is super mm -hmm. inspirational. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about how your life came to this point, to this mm -hmm. rock bottom sure. point? So how did that happen? Yeah. Um, well, it has a lot to do. Uh, so now that I finished this journey, I can sort of look back right from an outside perspective. And what I've learned is that what led me to rock bottom had a lot to do with my childhood and how I was raised. Right. So I won't go into too much detail, but, you know, I grew up in a in a poor working class um, family in the Silicon Valley, right? And the Silicon Valley is a, is a place of tremendous wealth. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, there's tech companies, there's money flowing in and out. Um, most of my friends growing up were very wealthy. They had happy families. Um, and I, I grew up, um, like I said, you know, pretty poor, right? So, so the memories I have from childhood is, is I remember, you know, things like um, going to between paydays, uh, I would go to the pawn shop with my mom for her to pawn her wedding rings until payday, right? So we could pay like the PG&E bill or the, right, the gas and electric bill. And those are the kind of memories that I have, right? And, um, you know, I also had a brother, an older brother who was in and out of prison. Um, there was a lot of, you know, alcohol and substance abuse in the house. And, um, you know, so just the way I grew up sort of... Um, you know, changed my thinking and the way that I looked at the world. And, and um, what I've also realized about that is, is when, when people grow up in, in, in a household like that, um, it's very easy to repeat that cycle. 
as they grow up and as they have kids um, to repeat the cycle, whatever it is, poverty, abuse, substance abuse, um, because that's, that's what you think is, is normal, right? Um, and, and so that's where I was. And so I, I grew up that way. And then when I was 18 or so, um, <clears throat> I, I was already getting myself into debt because I grew up in a family that didn't know how to manage money, right? So I was already starting to repeat that cycle, right? So I was the, the substance, right? So, so cigarettes, I was addicted to cigarettes. Um, I, I had credit cards, I didn't make the payments. Um, you know, I didn't, I never went to college. I, I still don't have a college degree. Um, and so, I, you know, the only job I could get is a, is a minimum wage job, right? So I'm setting myself up based on my childhood to sort of repeat, uh, repeat that cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the reason why I ask you this, because what really stood out to me from your book was that you said at age 22, you really had to make that decision. Am I going to continue this family cycle of poverty or am I going to change this for, for the better? And I can really resonate with this because I also grew up from a family uh, who came from a low income background and we were immigrants from Hong Kong and I did the whole path of like go to college, get good grades, only to realize like even after I have my UC Berkeley diploma, I'm still not getting that financial success that I would love to. And I find myself repeating the similar cycles too that that I adopted from my parents. So how how would you say like what were the steps that you personally taken to get out of that cycle because it's not easy so mm -hmm. how did you do it well it so for me it all came down to my mindset right and that's why i titled the book the mindset because um once i had this mindset i applied it to everything that i needed to change so the weight loss the smoking um getting out of debt building wealth uh getting myself into a good career um so i took that same mindset and applied it to everything um so for me, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. For me, the, the one thing that finally motivated me um, and finally was, I, I call, I refer to it as my why. So I finally had a why in life, right? Um, was when I found out that I was gonna be a dad because then I, ha I really had that decision to make, right? I have a, I'm gonna have a, a son now and do I want to continue the, the family cycle of, of poverty and, and all the other things? Do I want to pass this down and have him grow up like I grew up? And uh, obviously I didn't, right? Um, and so I had to then say, okay, how am I going to change all of these things, right? So now I have my motivation. Um, how am I going to do it? And so when it came to, um, to finances, for example, um, I had to, I had to sort of take a look at where I was today and then look at where I wanted to be and then break that up into like bite-sized goals. Right. And so that's sort of what I did for, for everything. Um, career wise was the, was the most challenging, I think. Um, because like I said before, I didn't have a college degree. Right. And so, um, whether you have a college degree or not, I, I think in today's world, um, it, it's, it's still gonna be difficult, even with a degree. And I'm sure, Miko, it sounds like you're experiencing that for yourself. Yes. Um, yeah, so, so it's challenging. And, and what I had to do is, um, I had to start at the very bottom and I had to work my way up step by step, right? And I, I had to do things that, um, that I didn't want to do. I had to do things that, um, you know, I had to humble myself to, to, to do things and put in the extra work and put in the extra effort. Um, you know, and at a high level, that's what it took. And, um, I mean, if you want to, if you want to discuss more about the specific career stuff, yeah, we can totally, we can totally do that. Yeah, I loved how you point out that the key was really to know where you want to be at the end goal and then reverse engineer it by step by step. Uh, that's really powerful. So can you touch on, so what is our audience listening right now? And they, they're also lacking that motivation, right? Mm. They, they don't have that why. So 
So not everyone has a son or daughter to work for right now. So what would some advice you can give to our audience in terms of how they can find that motivation mm. to get it going? <laughs> I th yeah, absolutely. And, and obviously this answer is going to be different for everybody, but I think just the ability to open yourself up to be able to identify something that is motivating you that you might not realize right? And everybody's motivated by different things. I mean, for me, like I said, it was my son. So that was very obvious. It was very sort of in your face. It's now or never sink or swim. You better do it. Right. But there's other people out there that, like you said, they, they might not be having a son or daughter and, and have that in your face motivation. But I guarantee you that there are things in their lives that if they were to just open themselves up and say, Hey, I could use this as motivation right? Maybe it's, it could be anything. It could be a relationship that's gone bad. Um, it could be something to do with family. It could be anything, right? Um, so I think that a, a key factor is, like I said, to, to open up their minds enough to be able to um, find motivation in things that are not, um, not the stereotypical uh, motivators like I had. Yes, I agree. So the first step really just to make the decision to be open, open to receiving that motivation. Okay, awesome. So you touch on uh, about the mindset, right? Because like the, the ace five years ago, obviously, it was not the same person as you are today. So you really did that inner transformation that mm -hmm. really took place to to get to where you're at right now. So so it sounds really abstract and probably some audience listening right now. So how can you, um, how would you suggest someone go about with doing this inner transformation? Like what are the tangible physical steps that you've taken mm. to make that happen? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, it starts with, um, and I alluded to this earlier, but it starts with setting that long-term main goal. Okay. Once they have that goal, break it up into bite-sized pieces that are easy to digest. Um, a tangible thing that worked for me, I'll, I'll give you one, one example. So weight loss for me, okay? So I lost 85 pounds in four months um, without ever going to the gym. It was all diet, right? It was all mental, all diet. And what I did is I wrote down, so I literally, I bought one of those desk um, calendars, right? And every day, I would weigh myself in the morning and I would write down my weight. And so for me, I'm a very visual person. So once I write it down on paper, it's real. I'm now committed to this, right? Um, and so it started with me writing out on paper all of my goals, writing down all of the bite-sized goals. And then to bring it back to the weight loss example, every day I would write down my weight on the calendar. Um, and the reason I did that is because I knew that if that day, if I wanted to, you know, cheat or eat something, you know, high calorie or whatever, that tomorrow morning, I would have only myself to blame when I weigh myself and write it down on the calendar, right? So there's a lot of, um, of personal responsibility involved as well. Um, and that's something that I had to, you know, talking about the internal um, emotional and mental change that I made. That was one thing that I had to sort of come to grips with um, or come to terms with is that there were a lot of things that that happened to me in my life and a lot of things that I experienced that um, that I, I was sort of feeling like a victim, right? Like if people owe me something, the world owes me something, right? Even though it wasn't my right? It wasn't my fault, right? And I sort of had maybe this chip on my shoulder when I was in my late teens. Um, but I realized that if I ever wanted to truly be successful, I had to take responsibility for things that happened to me, even though they weren't my fault, right? Because, yeah, I grew up poor and I didn't have a lot of opportunities that, that my peers had, but I had to take responsibility for that, right? Because if I blamed my parents for my whole life, yeah, that might make me, make me feel better, but I'm not going to actually improve my life and become successful unless I say to myself, yes, you grew up poor and it's your responsibility to get yourself out of it. 
Yeah, I agree with that so much. The turning point for me to in my life was the moment I took responsibility because that gives all the power back to yourself, and then you can really make the change. And I love what you said about writing out our goals because there's something I heard from a book or something before that says the moment we write something out, we turn it a thought into a tangible reality. So that is the first step to really making that happen. But Eighty, eighty yeah. plus pounds in four months yeah, without hitting the gym. Oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> that is like a dream for so many people. And so I want to take your mind a little bit, Ace, more so on the the poverty cycle, right? Because like I, I personally, I still struggle with this a lot uh, mm. with my mindset. It's like a, what's most difficult for me, I would say, is like constant daily of battling, like what I know now. And what the subconscious programming that is still running on a daily, moment-to-moment -moment basis. So, like, how do you, how do you overcome that? <laughs> yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, that's a really okay. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, there's something. So, so people like us that grew up in poverty, um, we tend our brains tend to be hardwired into this scarcity mindset, right? So. Even as even when I became wealthy, I would still constantly worry about money and things like that, right? And so that's something that is I realized at that point, like, hey, I'm no longer in poverty, but I still have these like fears and worries and things like that. So I definitely recognize that. Um, what I did for for me is I learned to use that scarcity mindset. Um, and apply it to different aspects of my life. So it actually turns that negative into a positive. And, and I'll give you an example. So the scarcity mindset for me, the way that it sort of manifested within me is that um, if I wanted something, if I had a chance to get something, I, my brain was hardwired as you better get it now or you'll never be able to get it, right? Um, and so that's just a personal thing for me because of the way that I grew up. And so I applied that to the growth that I wanted in things, right? So, so I applied that to, to my career, right? So, okay, Ace, you have an opportunity to, to go to this, um, you know, new startup company or whatever it is, right? And so the scarcity mindset, the way I turned that into a positive was like, okay, do it now or you'll never have this opportunity again. Right. And so that's how, so I sort of use that mindset into a positive um, and use that to sort of quickly um, accelerate my, my career. Right. Yeah. I, I love that. You're so good at turning something super terrible into a catalyst for a massive growth. And mm. that's all about a shift in your perspective. And and again, it all goes back to your mindset. So um, can you tell us a little bit about, when the success started to come in, was that um, a journey that took some time, took patience, or was this something that just kind of it all happened all at once? The moment uh, you you shifted the mindset, so right. how was that like for you? Well, I did it like a sprint. So, and, and look, the the famous saying "you can't build Rome in a day" is absolutely true. You can't. So, so. Us in society today are sort of, um, we expect instant gratification, instant results, um, that, that, right? We expect that. Um, but when it comes to actual growth and long-term growth and life-changing things, it's, it's not going to be fast. Um, and I knew that then and I, I still know that now, but I treated it like a sprint because what I did, again, the scarcity mindset, right? that I, that how I turned it into a positive, I was like, okay, you are motivated right now to lose weight, quit smoking, build your career, um, get out of debt, build wealth right now, Ace, you have this fire in you. So do as much as you can, as fast as you can. And that's, that's how I did it. Right. That was my mindset. Um, and so I did all of these things. This is the crazy thing is I did all of these things at the same time in five years. Right. So I lost the 85 pounds at the same time I was quitting smoking, um, at the same time that I was um, figuring out my financial stuff and getting myself out of debt, 
And at the same time that I was getting into the tech industry and building my tech career. So it was, it was all at once, but um, I had to use that fire while I had it, right? Wow. That takes massive mental power to do all of those things at the same time. Because even someone trying to make little changes, it takes a lot of mental willpower. So mm. kudos to you. <laughs> um, so I know that this journey requires daily moment to moment recommitment to yourself like to stay yes. motivated because like yes. just so but just because you have the fire now to say hey i'm ready to change but the next morning when you wake up you gotta recommit to that so how, how does someone go about with um staying committed to their own goals yep yeah i think that humans are very good at that initial um motivation like oh, okay i set a goal i'm so pumped i'm gonna do this right i'm gonna love the results and uh so we're really good at setting those goals and initially getting pumped we are very bad at continuing that level of feeling pumped up and motivated so you're you're totally spot on there um what i did and what worked for me is always coming back to my why right so um just an example right so so my why was my son Noah. Um, and so a quick example is when I was, you know, building the career in the tech industry, um, I would go to work all day long. I would go to school uh, all night long. So I would leave around 7 a.m. I'd come home around 11 p.m. Um, every day, right? And so what I would do is like when I come home after this long day and I'm feeling exhausted and I'm starting to question why am I doing this? You know, I could just have a regular, you know, easy job during the day, come home, watch Netflix all night, right? So why am I doing this? And so I would, um, I would go into his room at night when he's sleeping and I get home and I would just look at him. You know, he was, he was still a baby then, but, you know, I would look at him and I would watch him sleep and, and I would sort of, you know, say to myself, like, this is your why, right? Because you want him, you don't want him to know the life that you grew up in, right? And so I just kept coming back to my why. Every time I was doubting myself, like I would say, why are you doing this in the first place? Right? So your listeners and viewers out there, if they're struggling with those, um, with keeping that level of motivation, um, that my advice would be, yeah, just keep going back to your why, like, why did you decide to do this in the first place? You know, because obviously you decided to do it for a reason. Um, and, and that motivation, yeah, it, it definitely will fade over time. So you have to keep sort of, uh, refreshing it. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. And I have this thing where I like wrote out my goals and my why that I get to look at every oh, single yeah. day. Yeah, yeah, that really helps a lot. So what are some um, non-negotiable things that you would say for someone um, really on this journey for massive mm -hmm. transformation? So like personally for me, I know it's important that I surround myself with the right people. I need to mm -hmm. read every single day. So like what are some of the non-negotiables you would say for someone who's ready to make this move right now to change their life? Yeah. yeah. The non-negotiables is that you're going to have to sacrifice. But hands down, there's no way that you will accomplish any goal without sacrificing something. Um, so be prepared to make those sacrifices and fully commit in the beginning of the journey. I'm going to have to sacrifice things in my life. It might make me unhappy. It might make me feel miserable, but I'm doing it for this end goal. Right. Um, quick example for me, when I was on my journey, I went completely dark on social media. I didn't use Facebook, didn't use Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, nothing. Um, and the reason for that is because I knew, um, cause you know, I was, I had so many goals that I was working on at the same time, right? Weight loss, smoking, money, job, everything. Um, I knew that if I was looking at people's posts, like, um, of whatever vacations, food, car, you know, then my mind would be taken off of my goals and onto, oh, I want to eat that. I want to go there. I, you know, I want that. I want to buy that. Right. And so I couldn't allow any of my brain capacity to be focused on those things and worried about what other people are doing. Um, and so that was like a huge sacrifice, right? Because 
I, I essentially didn't have a social life for five years, right? Um, I, every, every day was just work, school, um, you know, working on my goals, everything. So I had zero social life, zero social media. Um, and that was a huge sacrifice. I mean, for, the, for your viewers, could you imagine, right? Not seeing a friend for five years, um, not logging on to Instagram for five years, right? And that's, yeah, that's what I did. And it was, it was crazy. So there were literally people who saw me, um, this is a funny story, saw me before um, my journey started and did not see me until my journey was complete. Um, and there were people that didn't even recognize me, right? Because I looked like a totally different person. I acted like a totally different person because I was, I essentially, I was a totally different person. Um, so yeah, just to bring it back to answer your question, absolute sacrifice is the number one thing. They're going to have to sacrifice something. So just get ready for that right now and don't complain about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think, I mean, it's totally worth it now. Look at where you're at now, even just taking five years out of your life to really mm. compound the work mm. and really compound the results. And now you have the rest of your life living the way that you truly want to. So so what I, what, what's life for you like now, now that you have all these success, like what, what is a daily life like for Ace? Wow. Like? <laughs> um, okay. That's a good question. Um, well, so every day, and this is something that's very different from when I was at the beginning of the journey. Um, every day I sort of have a plan for the day, right? So Routine is super, super important. That's something that I learned is a routine is very, very important to keep you structured mentally and emotionally. Um, if you, for folks that don't have routines, um, it's going to be very hard to accomplish any goals. So that's another thing that I want to really point out and emphasize along with the sacrifice thing is routine and structure is super, super important. Um, so for me, yeah, I mean, these days, um, yeah, life is very different now. So I always have a plan for the day. Um, you know, I'm working now at my uh, third startup um, in the Silicon Valley. Um, I coach, you know, Little League Baseball. Um, you know, I'm working on, on my second book already. Um, the first book, I, I mean, for, you know, I self-published the mindset. Um, and so it's, I've been very sort of, amazed by the success that it's had for a self-published book. Um, and so that motivated me to start working on my second book. And so that's what I'm working on now. Um, and yeah, so I, I mean, in a nutshell, that's sort of how my life is now. And then I have, you know, I have my, my kids that I'm taking care of and raising. Um, you know, I mentioned Noah, but I also have a daughter, uh, Ariel, who's 10. So um, yeah, those, that's kind of how my days are filled uh no <laughs> i love it <laughs> so so i know my audience are probably really really curious about this you mentioned that you didn't go to college right but you're still able to build a super successful career in the tech industry so how cool. how would you say like how does someone i know it's all about presentation how you believe you're in yourself and mm. um so how do you really put yourself in that community where people will perceive you as like you got what it takes to to be at this right. yeah yeah good question um well first of all you're not entitled to anything okay even if you have a college degree it doesn't entitle you to anything what i've noticed you know because now i've been working in the in the tech industry for for a decade right and so um Aside from the hard sciences, a degree is very good to sort of get your foot in the door. And then once you land that first job, then your success or failure is, is all upon you. It's all upon your work ethic. It's all upon, you know, how you perform, um, how you interact with your teammates. Um, and so there's a lot of variables that come into play once you're actually in a, a job or career. So for me, um, and I talk about this in my book. Um, so I started out as a janitor at a motel and <laughs> for six bucks an hour, right? Literally cleaning toilets. I mean, it was talk about rock bottom, right? So um, that's where I was. And then when I found out I was going to be a dad, I, I didn't want to be a janitor. And so I looked for what type of job can I get 
for someone that doesn't have any experience, doesn't have a college degree, um, but is a hard worker, right? So I found a job as a security guard. And so I was a security guard in a tech company, I, a security guard at TiVo, actually. And, you know, I, I'm a very social guy. So I, you know, I talk to people and the, the, the people that work at the tech company at, at TiVo. Um, and so I realized that there were some jobs, one of them being QA, that, um, that you can do in the tech industry that didn't require a college degree. So as long as you know how to do the job and you have the skills then, then, um, and experience, then you can do it, right? So I was able to go from security guard at TiVo to getting a job as a, it's called a manual tester. It's essentially the lowest um, rung on the ladder, okay? Um, but I was thrilled to do it, right? So I wasn't too good for it. Um, I didn't feel like I was entitled to more, nothing. I was like, I'll take this opportunity, right? The scarcity mindset. I'll take this opportunity and I'll do it and I'll do it the best I can right now. Um, and so that's what I did, right? And so I was now um, working in the tech industry. Yes, super low, super low pay, but I was in, right? I had my foot in the door. And so um, from then on, it was my work ethic. It was how much am I willing to do um, in order to grow, right? And I think what happens what I've seen, at least in my personal experience, is that a lot of people, um, they get comfortable and complacent once they're in a job where it's like, hey, I have an okay salary, I like my job, um, and they just get comfortable there and they don't wanna grow anymore. Um, and so I think it's important to never be comfortable, never be complacent in where you are and always try to sort of you know, keep climbing that ladder, whether it's in career, or, or personal things, whatever, always keep sort of climbing, you know, onward and upward is the same, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love how you really say, focus on what's immediately in front of you one step yeah. at a time. And you're like the perfect example to show that anything is possible, really anything is possible with your journey and your you are an inspiration for so many of us out here. So um, yeah. Ace, why don't you touch on, um, so, this is a question I ask all of my experts on this show, right? So okay. I know you're talking to the audience in our 20s, early 20s, late 30s right now. So what are some things that you wish someone would have told you when you were still in your 20s? Mm, mm, good question. Okay. Um, two things, two things. So one always set your goal as a stretch goal. So I'm trying to think of the best way to articulate this. So something that I realized on my journey is that I was my own worst enemy. So if I, I'll make a simple example. So if I set my goal as doing 10 pushups, right? Right when I get to around seven or eight pushups, my mind is going to start telling me, oh, you're tired. Just stop now. Right. And that's when I'm going to start fighting myself internally. But if I set my goal at 15 pushups, I'll breeze past 10. Right. And I won't start feeling that mind fighting me until 12 or 13 pushups. Right. So set stretch goals. Um, if you hit it, awesome. If you don't hit it, you'll have hit what your original goal was, if that makes sense. So that's the first thing. The second thing is start now. So if your viewers are in your 20s, do it now. Do it before you have kids to worry about. Do it before you have a mortgage payment to worry about. Um, the older you get, the harder goals are gonna be to accomplish and the more excuses you're gonna be able to come up with to not even start these goals in the first place. So absolutely start now, start today. Yes, I love it so much because I that's something I always tell my friends too. like we are at the best time to take the biggest risk right now because there's really nothing to lose. We can always bounce back if something doesn't doesn't work out the way it, we want to be. So, um, you know, I, I also want to ask you, like you, you mentioned that a lot of times we are our own biggest enemy. So like mm -hmm. how, how so I know like at the beginning, how did all these mindset shifts happen? Where did you find yourself a mentor? Did you just pick up a book? How did you start thinking the way that you do today? 
That's a, that's a good question. Um, and the reality is, is I, I didn't do either of those things. I didn't have a mentor. Um, I, I wasn't, you know, reading books at that time. There, there wasn't a book like the mindset, um, to, to have motivated me. Um, it, it was all just this, this, you know, mental, it, it just, it was like a light switch for me. Right. Um, and it was, it was, it was just a, um, like I said, yeah, it was a light switch and I felt that fire and I felt that motivation and it was like, okay, just do everything now. Right. But what sort of worked for me. And again, with the fighting against myself is I had to come to terms with my weaknesses. And so I had to, I had to know myself fully and hold myself accountable. And I think this is something that yeah, I mean, people might be able to get this from a mentor. People might be able to get this from a book. Um, but any of your viewers, you have me here telling you directly, right? Know yourself fully, including your weaknesses, and take accountability for that. And so, and use that in order to accomplish the goal. Figure out how to use it. That's important, right? So for me personally, when I quit smoking, um, I had been a pack-a-day smoker for about seven years, and I, would, I had tried to quit so many times in those seven years and I was never able to do it. And so the reason, the way I was finally able to quit is I had to lie to myself because I knew my weakness. I knew that if I told myself I was quitting smoking, then every day, every minute of every day, I would be thinking about not smoking. And then it's sort of like a battle of wills against me and this addiction. And I knew I would fail and I had to be accountable for that. And I had to know that that was my weakness and figure out how to, you know, maneuver that. And so the way I was able to quit smoking is I lied to myself. I kept a pack of cigarettes in my car, in the glove box. And I, I told myself, Ace, you're not quitting smoking. You're just putting off that next cigarette, right? Just don't have it right now. Have it in like an hour. And then in an hour, I would make up another excuse, right? And I just kept that going and kept that going. And so, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's how I did it. Yeah, that's so powerful. But the amazing thing is that now with uh, access to technology and people like you and the books that, for example, the minds that we have so much access to these amazing teachers and teachings at the, in the palm of hand yeah. today. And so like, <laughs> I want to tell my audience, like, if you guys are looking to get out, you know, lose weight or get off addictions, overcome poverty, like Ace Book is the go-to. <laughs> Definitely it's on Amazon. <laughs> uh, make sure to check it out. Um, so we are wrapping up this interview right now. Ace, it has been super amazing talking to you and hearing more about your journey. So I know you are also really passionate about helping people out there and really creating the life that they truly love and overcoming their own limitations. Yes. So I know you have prepared something special special for our audience today. So can you tell us a little bit about the free gift that you are offering? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to give your audience the first chapter of my ebook for free. Awesome. Um, and so hopefully that they, they, they can read that and they can at least get a sense of, of where the book is going. And then also what I've done um, is on Amazon, I have my the mindset um, on Kindle Unlimited. So if they have a Kindle Unlimited subscription, they can read it for free. Um, they don't need to buy the book. Because um, at this point, like you mentioned, I'm not, my book is not out there for me to profit off of. I just want to get it into as many people's hands as possible um, so they can find you know, motivation and truly see that if, if I could do it, anybody can do it. Yeah, you're so amazing, Ace. That's genuine intention really right there from your heart to serve people. And, and I really appreciate that. Um, so how can our listeners find you online? I know they absolutely love you now <laughs> after they heard your story. So if they want to continue to learn more from you, uh, follow your footsteps, how can they find you online? Um, yeah, so I have my website, acebowers.com. Okay. Um, that's my blog. So I usually post, I blog weekly. They can subscribe there. Um, they can also find me on Twitter at real ace Bowers. Um, and the other thing on my blog is I have a contact form. So I always, when, when readers, um, or, or fans, 
um, contact me if they need advice, if they have questions. I, I happily answer um, as long as I have the time, um, I will reply to your email. So they can go to my website, acebowers.com, fill out the contact form. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm happy to, to respond and, and try to help, uh, help them out if I can. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Ace. It has been super amazing talking to you on this interview. So to, for our audience, thank you so much for tuning in and make sure you come back to watch the next interview where we'll be going over more exciting stories about financial independence and mindset shift and inner transformation. So thank you, everyone. I'll see you next time.